So if zooxanthellae leave, it's possible that anemones be more vulnerable to the uh, being fed upon by the oil traps. So it's possible that it could be having a larger impact, such as mortality or causing them to die, as opposed to just kind of, you know, right now they tend to survive that predation and continue to move on. So it could impact population dynamics, it could impact the number of oil traps and the number of anemones. Um, and then every time you have one species change, so if all these anemones left, or if something horrible like that was to happen, you'd have changes in the, so the shelters they provide, the cover, if you look down here, there's tons of like snails, crabs, and other things that live on and around them to remove that habitat as well. They have done work on sea stars, though. They show that really small changes in temperature of like two degrees Celsius have a dramatic impact on their feeding rates. So you have these primary predators, I hear these keystone predators, which we've always said are really important for maintaining community diversity. But if there's even a small shift in temperature up or down, it tends to have a really large impact on how much they eat. So they could really change the community dynamics by changing the importance of predators in the system. Hi there, I'm Scott Simon. I'm the manager of the Research Experience and Education Facility. It's a teaching aquarium here at the University of Santa Barbara, California. So, sort of to set our story then, we have these beautiful kelp forests in California. And kelp, although plant life is not a plant, it's a protist. Um, it photosynthesizes like a plant but doesn't have roots uh, and some other structure. Uh, this is a red abalone. They, uh, they like to eat seaweed. Um, but they're also very tasty. Uh, they're a little bit harder to process. Um, they go for $75 a pound now uh, in the commercial market. So there's a lot of pressure uh, to continue fishing. The purple urchins like to feed on the kelp. The red urchins like to feed on the kelp. There are some organisms then above these guys that like to feed on them. So first we have the spiny lobster, which actually feeds on the smaller um, urchins. So here we get a little up close and personal with uh, California spiny lobster. The first thing you may notice, most people think when they think of lobsters, think of big pinchers. Our lobsters don't have any pinchers, but they have um, a spiny exoskeleton, which serves uh, in protection. And that sort of grinding noise that you hear there um, is a defense and communication mechanism. The lobsters uh, will feed on those smaller urchins, as well as a fish that we don't have in the tanks right now, but the California sheep also preys on the urchins. Um, the abalone likes, as I said, likes to feed on the kelp, but eats it in a, in a less harmful manner. 
by sort of grazing um, on the blades. Same thing with the red urchin. The purple urchins like to graze the, the kelp down at the hold fast and it releases the rest of the structure, uh, and so we lose a lot of kelp for it. So we've lost these to fishing. We fish these red urchins out, and so basically you're removing, we fish the lobster and we fish the California sheephead, and basically you're reducing a lot of the pressure on the competitive pressure on the purple urchin, and so we have what are called urchin barrens now, which are large areas of a lot of urchins, but not a lot of other things. So we reduce the biodiversity um, and the function of the kelp forest ecosystem. Um, there's one other organism in that, and that's the otter, uh, which we no longer have south of Point Conception, basically. Those were hunted during the uh, beginning of the last century to near extinction. Their populations are increasing again, but we have the sea otter, which is the, which is the apex predator, um, which also feeds on abalone and urchins, um, helping to keep that balance. So this entire system has been out of balance for, for over the last century now, based on various forms of uh, human pressure. If you had a loss of predators, it could result in a loss of you know, top-down control of systems. If you have instances where one predator controls feeding or grazing by another herbivore or another predator, um, an example of that is when we removed the otters from the area. Otters eat the urchins, so when we removed all the otters, the urchin population jumped up because there's no longer any predators. And as a result of that, the urchins overgraze the kelp beds. So these really productive, lush kelp forests we used to have turned into what we call urchin barrens, because you would go out and the urchins can basically eat, they could snip right through the hold fast at the bottom, and you lose a 40 foot piece of kelp from one or two, you know, from one urchin feeding on this thing. And that's because there's no predators that reduce their population or make them seek refuge.